I'm pleased to see he's stuck to a small, very simple Italian menu. Eat it. It's good. For mains, my plate's piled high with a clumsy mess of ribs, spicy chicken jambalaya, and corn and bean succotash. <laughs> And everything's freshly cooked. You can close your eyes and actually count the flavours, the seps, the walnuts, the pasta. This is the kind of food we should be serving. Real, hearty, rustic, wholesome Italian food. <laughs> boy's got to eat. He got to have his supper. Come here, boy. Finally, some good fucking food. We've got a lot of things going on in this dish. I tried to bring as much as I could. Sometimes the best things in a dish are the things that are not in a dish. You dirty lying little shit bird! Look, unless you have any more surprises up your sleeve, I suggest oh. you... <laughs> now that would be telling, Ethan. And I don't do spoilers. Oh. Uh, hey guys. It's been a while, hasn't it? Sorry about that. You might be wondering where I've been, and that's a story for another time. But instead of talking about where I've been or what I've been doing, let's instead talk about what I'm currently doing. And what I'm doing right now is hunting gators. Want to join me? Great. I haven't had much luck, but maybe together we'll catch ourselves a big old gator. We got this. Man, what a lousy day's catch. Well, it is getting dark. I guess you can stay with me for the night. Come on, my place ain't too far from here. Well, this is my place. If you get hungry or thirsty, there's Monster Energy and Doritos in the trunk. Huh? Uh, yeah, I know, I haven't been consistently uploading lately, and I'm sorry about that. But, to be fair, I did release a three hour long edited playthrough of Resident Evil Village about three weeks ago. Don't forget to go check out that Bad King Plays if you haven't already. Daddy appreciates you. I just want to have like a fun time. Now what was your plan here tonight? Have a, have a, have a fun uh, time. Have a fun time? Yeah. Like I said, no peripheral vision. Damn! No, 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 no! That's a lot of no's. Oh, hold on, what's this? I am the danger. Heisenberg! Who's that? Bring it on! Oh! He's Godzilla! He's Godzilla! Execute clown mode. Why can't I take on my gun? Boom! Splendid timing! Those two are just in time for the fireworks show! Boom! <laughs> Boom! Hey, you know, this whole situation with hunting gators, talking about Resident Evil 8, and seeing those clips from my RE8 playthrough has got me thinking about one of my favorite games of all time. Have you ever heard of Resident Evil 7? January 24th, 2017 was a day that changed the world forever. It was the release date for Resident Evil 7. 
Before we get any further, perhaps it would be best, as with my movie reviews, to start with a story summary in order to get people up to speed and to ground us before we dissect the game even further as we explore its plot, characters, atmosphere, and even take a look at all the DLC. All this and more, coming right up. The game begins with a video from Mia Winters with an update to her husband Ethan while she's out for work abroad with her babysitting job. The video ends and the mood shifts as a distressed woman, who turns out to be Mia, records a new video for Ethan, urging him to stay away. All I can say is that if you get this, stay away. We then shift over to Ethan himself, who has headed to Dolby, Louisiana, because he has received word from Mia herself that she is indeed alive and she wants him to pick her up. Ethan, seeing nothing wrong with this situation, arrives at the location where he can find Mia as he comes across a big ass mansion with a locked gate. Ethan is not deterred and proceeds to do some exploration and reconnaissance. He comes across an abandoned van with a project proposal for something called Sewer Gators, with a picture of three men on the front. Ethan then stumbles across a very ominous figure and follows him to a smaller side house, disconnected from the big main house. What the fuck is this piece of shit? Upon exploring the disgusting and filthy interior, Ethan uncovers the fate of the sewer gators in a tape he comes across. This introduces the fact that this is no ordinary house, and perhaps the residents are not so ordinary at all. Something about this residence is evil. Using the found footage tape Ethan finds helps him uncover a secret passage that leads to a ladder. After his descent down the ladder, Ethan finds the corpse of Andre. Despite all the clear red flags and clear signs of danger and possible hillbilly psychos, Ethan decides to proceed further into the residence regardless. He stumbles upon a makeshift jail cell that has very clearly held his wife captive for quite some time now. Has she really spent the past three years in this one makeshift cell? Mia is surprised to see Ethan and proceeds to contradict herself, which, if you're an eagle-eyed gamer... Oh wait, fuck! Mia is surprised to see Ethan and proceeds to contradict herself, which, if you're an eagle-eared gamer, you would pick up on as being very fishy and your 29th clue that something is horribly wrong about this whole situation. Mia soon disappears, and the two are separated for a few brief moments. Upon investigating some pounding knocks coming from the basement, Ethan is attacked by a transformed Mia who almost seems to be possessed by a demon. She clearly fights back and almost shows remorse and regret for hurting Ethan. However, Mia is not strong enough to stave off her possession and turns on Ethan once again, drawing more blood and resulting in Ethan defending himself with an axe to her chest cavity. A nearby landline rings, and a mysterious woman named Zoe claims that there is a way out through the attic, as most of the house's doors and windows are locked and barred shut with planks of wood. Ethan's one weakness. Glad to see he got over his wood problem, though, and he and Mia managed to have a kid before the start of RE8. To the player's dismay, there is the distinct sound of a door closing, and Mia's body is missing from where you last left her. Ethan heads towards the attic, but is greeted by a clearly pissed off Mia who repays him by chainsawing off his arm. There's good use of the camera shutter sound made famous by the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films. Ethan, it's okay. Mia once again fights herself and runs off into the darkness once again, mumbling to herself. Ethan is too busy to notice though, as he picks up his severed hand. As he carries on for his only exit in the attic, Ethan is stopped by Mia, who drove, 
who somehow drove all the way to her nearest Menards to pick up a nice loud chainsaw. Save big money at Menards. Ethan once again proceeds to battle his wife. If not already made apparent, this battle clearly confirms that something is wrong with Mia, as she is able to tank multiple headshots and straight up eat even magazines of pistol ammo. Upon attempting to escape once again, Ethan is stopped by Daddy Baker as he gives us that simply iconic line in delivery. You'll love to see it. Welcome to the family, son. <laughs> Ethan is then killed. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> He's knocked out and carried to the main house by Jack Baker, who has also brought Mia along for the ride. Ethan soon fades out of consciousness again, but hears Zoe's voice, who has somehow stapled his hand back to his arm. Ethan soon wakes up to find himself in for a dinner date with the Baker family, or at least most of the family's members. This introduces us to some of the main antagonists in the Baker family and shows us their personalities and family dynamic. We are introduced to Jack Baker, the father, Marguerite Baker, the mother, and Lucas Baker, the son. Oh, and uh, can't forget about Granny Baker either. And for some of this review, I may refer to Jack and Marguerite as Mommy and Daddy Baker. Just, just roll with it, alright? This is also one of my favorite cutscenes for a game ever. It is so memorable and steaming with atmosphere, vision, character, and it is filled to the brim with personality, which is a pretty good way of describing most of this game. But We'll get more in depth later. Where, where am I? What the hell? Rise and shine, sleepyhead. It's time for supper. Who, who are all you people? Where's Mia? <laughs> Eat it. It's good. Dumb some bitch was no good if it hit him. Hit boy's got to eat. He got to have his supper. Come here, boy. Let's do this. Come on. Shit, oh shit, oh shit. He's not eating the jack. He's not eating it. Get the hell up, Marguerite. I'll face it for him. Get the hell out of here. You're a son of a bitch. Oh, I can't believe it. You son of a bitch. He's not eating it. He's not eating it. This was supposed to be a very special feast. Come on, boy. God damn it. I bet it's that cop again. God damn pigs. I'm coming back for you. The dinner date is cut short as three of the bakers leave Ethan and Granny alone at the table. This provides Ethan with a chance to break free from his restraints. To Ethan's dismay though, Jack Baker has returned to the area and is not so pleased to discover that Ethan has escaped. Even though it's kind of like, bruh, you guys literally left him unsupervised, apart from Granny. Like Jack, you should not be surprised at this man. Ethan manages to make contact with a deputy who provides Ethan with a knife after Ethan <laughs> asked him for his gun. The two then meet up in the garage, and unfortunately, as the tensions escalate, Deputy Marvin Branagh loses his temper and his head. This leads to the first boss battle against Daddy Baker, the garage fight, which is a fun and memorable boss battle with lots of fun and over-the-top moments. It's got the right amount of horror, tension, adrenaline, and goofy B-movie fun. This is especially true for just about all of Jack's boss battles. Oh yeah, I'm gonna take you for a ride. No, 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 no! <laughs> Upon surviving the battle, Ethan limps away and is taken by surprise as Jack Baker commits not alive in Minecraft, giving Ethan a chance to catch his breath and heal as he prepares for the fight ahead. Ethan receives another phone call from Zoe and must find three dog head crests to form a Cerberus in order to give Ethan access to the backyard area and escape the mansion. 
Ethan comes across another tape recorded by Mia using the sewer rat's left behind camera, foreshadowing a future objective and giving Marguerite some spotlight. Where do you think you're going? <laughs> to Ethan's dismay, he soon comes to find that Jack Baker is alive and well. His head is regenerating at a rapid rate as he demonstrates the gift he has been given from his little girl. My little girl has given us a gift, and this gift is with me always. A new type of enemy makes its appearance in the form of the molded, towering, almost venom-looking creatures that are highly aggressive and can tank a lot of damage. The old granny menacingly pops up in different locations, ignored by the molded, multiple times, confirming that she is indeed the same as the others. In order to progress further and escape, Ethan is forced to battle Daddy Baker once again in a very groovy boss battle, complete with hanging corpses, karate kicks, a chainsaw duel, and a barrage of bullets, leading to Jack literally blowing up like he's a DBZ villain. Unfortunately, you do not get to keep the chainsaw, as it breaks in order for you to progress further in the campaign. But now, Ethan will soon come face to face with even more and greater threats than what he's dealt with so far as he escapes the house, stepping foot out into the backyard. What's wrong with you, man? You're slipping. But you can't check your six. Robert? Ethan heads to the one safe haven in the yard, the trailer. The trailer is filthy and filled with all kinds of goodies and supplies. It is obvious that this is where Zoe has been living the past few years. There's supplies and ammo for her, a fridge with food, television for entertainment, and best of all, the trailer is a safe room, so she's literally guaranteed safety in there. No bad guys can set foot in here. After a brief moment to catch his breath, Ethan ventures further into the nightmare once again. Exploring another house leads to a new boss, Marguerite, who has a, a bug fetish, I believe is the scientific term. Ethan needs a few key ingredients to make a serum to cure people infected with the virus in order to save Zoe and Mia. Mia comes face to face with Ethan again, only to be dragged off by the upcoming boss after Marguerite, Lucas Jigsaw Baker. But focusing on the here and now, with Marguerite standing in his way, Ethan is soon forced to defeat her in single combat. Oh, and did I mention that Ethan found a flamethrower? Ethan absolutely stunts on her, and she literally falls to pieces after a pretty dope and scary bug-filled boss battle. Ethan then finds something known as a D-Series arm, the first of the two main components necessary for the cure. Zoe supposedly has the second component, the head. Let's hope her head game is strong. After failing to meet up at the trailer, Ethan receives a call from Lucas, who has a series of trials to put Ethan through. Ethan soon comes across Lucas, who has a more indirect way of killing Ethan. Traps. Anyway, after being put through the ultimate escape room experience, Ethan causes Lucas to flee after failing his numerous attempts to murder Ethan. Ethan then comes across a captured Mia and Zoe, and upon freeing them, you hand Zoe the D-Series arm and head, which gives just enough for two serums. 
However, a giant kaiju version of Daddy Baker shows up to battle Ethan again. Ethan is forced to use one of the serums on Jack Baker, who absolutely refuses to go down and is tougher than ever. He is also encouraged by Zoe to do so. Use the serum on him! This results in Jack almost crystallizing, but not quite falling apart. With only one dose left, Ethan is faced with the extremely perplexing moral dilemma of giving the serum to Mia, the love of his life, his wife who has been missing for three years. Or some chick he met five minutes ago. Ethan and Mia escape, leaving behind an angry Zoe. The two are soon separated again after being given barely a minute to themselves. This leads to Ethan being captured by a scary and ominous little girl who has made brief appearances up until recently. This girl is named Evelyn, and upon the capture of Ethan, the player takes control of Mia as we uncover her past that she kept hidden from Ethan. Mia traveled on a boat alongside Evelyn and a man named Alan. Mia and Alan were handlers for a bioweapon in the form of an 11 year old evil little girl. She is the originator, she being the little girl, not Mia, is the originator of the mold as she throws up creating new molded soldiers to massacre everyone on the ship and even turning some of the crew into her playthings as well. Mia is like a badass agent and fights her way through the ship both in the flashback and in the present day giving a nice little juxtaposition between the way the ship has changed after the events that transpired three years ago when Mia and Alan failed to contain Evelyn. It is revealed that three years ago Mia was infected by Evelyn with the mold, and upon fighting Evelyn's control, Mia sends her final message to Ethan, urging him to stay away. However, Evelyn is the one who manipulated and controlled Mia into contacting Ethan after three years because Evelyn wants a family of her own. And now, she wants Ethan as her father, rather than Jack Baker who has played that role up until now. Mia fights Evelyn's control in order to free Ethan. She then separates herself from Ethan, and also gives Ethan some of Evelyn's genetic material, which is necessary in order to kill her. Ethan has no choice but to carry on my wayward son. And yes, Ethan will never mention Lucas Baker again for the, for the rest of his time with the series. After resuming control of Ethan, it is apparent that someone has been keeping an eye on the Bakers for at least a few weeks, and now they're executing some kind of operation. Who are these mysterious new strangers? Well, we'll get to it when we get to it. Ethan fights through hordes of molded and all kinds of varieties from the base molded to the four-legged molded to the venomar molded and of course the fat boys. Last stop is the Baker's side house from the beginning where you first encountered Mia. The room that held the game's first real boss battle also sets the stage for the beginning of the game's final boss battle against Granny Baker who is revealed to be Evelyn, who has grown older at a rapid rate due to being a test tube baby and a lab creation with the sped up aging factor. Injecting her with the serum causes her to undergo an extreme classic bonkers Resident Evil transformation, just like the old ones, as she becomes a huge molded creature that is bigger than the whole house. Ethan is overwhelmed until a hovering helicopter drops him a Call of Duty care package with a weapon specialized for combating bioweapons. Friendly care package inbound. Ethan uses the weapon to eliminate Evelyn and the nightmare is mostly over. Ethan is saved by Chris Redfield who has had a bit of a character model change, but a mostly welcome one in my eyes. Chris is revealed to be working alongside New Umbrella, a version of Umbrella atoning for its past sins and eliminating rogue bioweapons. New Umbrella and Chris also picked up Mia. On the helicopter, Ethan and Mia are reunited, depending on your choice, and the two fly off into the sunset with a hopeful and bright future ahead of them as the nightmare is finally over. 
and they can go on to live happily ever after. Resident Evil has been a popular series since 1996. The first three entries are B-movie-esque zombie survival horror games with corporate espionage, conspiracy, and corruption peppered in. RE4 pointed the series in a more action-oriented direction and went from a fixed camera perspective to a third person over the shoulder view. It was successful and loved by fans all over the world, even if it was a new direction and change for the series. Then you get to Resident Evil 5, Boulder Punching Simulator, which is where the series starts to get more divisive and a larger part of the fanbase started along for an entry that resembled the first few entries. Make no mistake, RE5 was very profitable and has many fans and defenders to this day. Upon the release of Resident Evil 6 though, fans and public opinion grew even more divided as Resi 6 ramped up the stakes, action, and set pieces even further. That's where RE7 and I step into the picture. I always knew of Resident Evil growing up, but it never particularly caught my eye. I was a growing, strapping young lad getting his nourishment from Mountain Dew and Nacho Cheese Doritos who grew up playing stuff like the old CODs, Medal of Honors, the OG Halo games, Star Wars games, Left 4 Dead, and games of that nature. I was never really a big horror gamer. One of the only horror games I had ever played growing up was Dino Crisis. Great fucking game by the way. We need a remake! Please, Capcom, make it happen. I'll do anything. Fuck. <laughs> 2014 was my junior year of high school, and it was an important year for me as a gamer because it made me fall in love with horror games. 2014 released two gems, Alien Isolation and Evil Within, two of my personal favorite games. This introduced me to horror gaming as both are very different horror games. Evil Within being more action oriented and Alien Isolation doing its best to make the player feel weak and vulnerable at all times. The point is that prior to Resident Evil 7, I was far from what I would call a fan of the franchise as I had only barely begun to dip my toes into horror. However, Resident Evil 7 in January of 2017 is what changed that and made me an RE fan for life. Resident Evil 7 really caught my eye with its marketing and unique look. The trailer for the game looked really appealing. It was this dirty, grimy, disgusting looking horror game. It looked scary and exciting. The first person perspective really immediately made me feel as if this was a game I could jump into as a lover of first person shooters growing up. This was the perfect time for me to hop on the Resident Evil hype train because this was a new chapter for the franchise. Resident Evil 7 is the game that single-handedly saved Capcom's public image, changed their public perception, and began a new renaissance for Capcom and Resident Evil as a whole. After playing Resident Evil 7, I was personally hooked on Resident Evil. I went on to play the remake of RE1, uh, RE0, I couldn't get a hold of RE2 and 3, so I went on to play 4, 5, and then I played about an hour of 6. To my delight, Capcom came out with remakes of RE2 and 3 in third person. I played those a couple of times over, especially 2. Now that you know the story's summary, have a basic idea of the series standing at the time, and now that you know how I got into the series, let's discuss some of the nitty gritty of the game. Welcome to the family, son. Let's start off with the baddies of RE7, the Bakers. What I love about the Bakers is how most of them represent different genres and styles of horror with their themes and mechanics. Jack is a near unstoppable slasher villain. You can unload bullets into him, but he keeps getting up even when you think you've already killed him. Jack even survived the main story. He officially dies in a story DLC where you play as his boxing hillbilly brother. But we'll get to the DLC later. Then there's Marguerite, who has a mix of Cronenberg body horror and almost creature feature vibes. She transforms into an insect-human hybrid reminiscent of the fly and reminds me of the movie Mimic. 
Lastly, there's Lucas Baker, who does not have a traditional physical boss battle with Ethan. Lucas instead relies on traps, treachery, and torture, similar to the Saw films and Collector series. Then there's Mia, who's like a mini Daddy Baker with some Texas Chainsaw vibes. Can't ignore that Evelyn, who along with Mia, both give off Ringu and Ring Girl vibes. But hey, let's dive into some of the writing, personality, themes, gameplay sections, and mechanics of some of these individual characters. While not a villain, let's start off with Mia, as she is the first enemy in the game. She's a good introductory mini-boss to teach you mechanics and game basics. She is an especially good introduction as you ramp up with Jack Baker, who is superior to Mia in every way when it comes to physical speed, strength, regen ability, and durability. I love the details of seeing how hard she's fighting back against Evelyn's control in recent playthroughs, especially noticing dialogue like her lines referring to containment after cutting off Ethan's hand. In my jaws, my I love how after Ethan defends himself from a possessed Mia as Evelyn's control falters while Mia is passing out, she reaches her hand out for Ethan and he does the same as she falls to the ground. <laughs> There's a lot of little character moments and details in the game such as this that I love. It adds more personality to the characters in small and subtle ways. I especially like playing as Mia during the ship sections, both in the present and the past. For a lot of people, this section seems to be lackluster and weak. I disagree, however. Out of the most recent Resident Evil games, there's always sections where you relinquish control of the main characters and play another important character. There's Sherry and Ada's sections in RE2, Carlos's section in RE3, and the Ashley section in RE4. Similarly, there's Mia's section on the boat, and out of all of these side sections, my personal favorite is Mia's section. This section helps flesh out her character and backstory slightly, but adds another layer and dimension to Mia's character to find out that she was kind of a badass operative that could combat bioweapons. This makes Ethan seem even more normal by comparison. I do think that the beginning of the ship section is a little tedious and it maybe goes on just a tad bit too long, but as a whole I like it. Going back to Mia's character however, Mia shows compassion for her fellow operatives, can kick ass, and is strong enough to fight back against Evelyn's control multiple times in the story in order to save Ethan. Mia loves Ethan so much that she would rather he stay away and be safe, which is why she sends the first message in the beginning. However, Evelyn's control forces Mia to send Ethan an email, luring Ethan to Louisiana. Mia has a nice duality between the normal, almost sweet sounding Mia, who hides a badass beneath the surface, versus the absolutely unhinged serial killer Himiko Toga, <laughs> you know? that Mia becomes, she almost becomes like a ring character under Evelyn's influence. Regardless if Ethan chooses Mia or Zoe in the decision mid-game, which is a pretty weak ass decision, but we'll get there. Regardless of your decision, Mia is still willing to fight back and attempt to spare Ethan any more suffering at Evelyn's hands, even if he chose Zoe. Mia is a cool character who is more than just a damsel in distress. The objective of the game is to save Mia. She's kind of the Princess Peach of the game, and the Baker's estate is Bowser's castle. However, even though she needs to be saved, she is a bit more complex than that. As we discussed, she is a badass, has a cool backstory, has a strong bond with Ethan, she's selfless, is the character who most often overcomes Evelyn's control, even if only momentarily. And she's a really sympathetic character who you want to see overcome the past three years of torture, trauma, and bondage that she has experienced. Anyway, Mia's a good character in my book. Going in order, let's talk about Daddy Baker since he appears right after Mia's section. 
Jack is very tanky and can handle immense physical damage. He's a Jason-esque horror movie villain. He even slow walks and everything. You have multiple boss battles and encounters with him. He can stalk you in the halls of the house where he may as well be invincible. You can shoot him, which eats through your precious ammo and resources to stun him, but this only buys you a brief amount of time to breathe and run. Mostly run. Jack's near invincibility makes sense mechanically because of his super regen abilities when compared to your limited arsenal. Then there's the first real Daddy Baker boss battle in the garage. This fight is a good indicator of what to expect in terms of quality and boss battles in the rest of the game. Not all of them are great, but all of them have at least something to like, be it mechanically, atmospherically, or visually. This boss battle has multiple approaches. You could get trigger happy and start shooting at Jack as soon as you get a gun, but you could also just rush and get the car keys while Jack is distracted and lay him out like he's the creeper. I didn't hear no bell. <laughs> How the fuck did he not die? This saves you ammo and gets you to the end of the boss fight. However, if you are slow enough, Jack can get the upper hand on you by going for the vehicle first, turning the tables in an instant. If you aren't careful, this can quickly result in a death screen for you. You better start running, man. <laughs> He can even pull you out of the driver's seat and hop in as well, so make sure you've got some distance between you both if you start the car. Jack taking control of the vehicle might seem difficult, but if you're a real gamer girl like me, you can overcome all adversity like the queen you are by emptying magazines full of ammo into Jack's head and avoiding the vehicle's path. Okay. I see you. <laughs> I'm gonna squash you like a bug. <laughs> Hope Marguerite didn't hear that. Jack Baker has so much personality and character, he's sadistic and takes pleasure in stalking and battling Ethan. Jack wants to prove his superiority to Ethan because of Evelyn wanting Ethan to be her new surrogate father. This adds a bit of extra spice to their relationship to each other as characters and almost adds a rivalry dynamic between Jack and Ethan. Jack is the antagonist you encounter most as you have three boss battles with him and multiple stalking sections as well. Jack's second boss battle is especially fun because you can waste a lot of ammo by shooting Jack while he uses a makeshift chainsaw thing, or you can grab a normal chainsaw of your own and you can have a fucking chainsaw fight. It's so cool. There's even an Ash reference. This boss battle is metal as fuck. Another neat mechanic is that you can kick hanging corpses to stun Jack for a second. In this battle, Jack also has a distinct attack that can insta-kill you if he lands it successfully. However, you can avoid death by hitting him with the corpse, shooting him in the face with the big gun, dodging, and supposedly there's a way of ducking to dodge the attack, but I have never, not even once, successfully achieved this. There is an achievement for accomplishing this, and I will never get it. You can also use the corpses and brick pillar to avoid Jack's attack, but if you rely on using these to juke him, 
Jack will get angry and cut down the corpses and even destroy the center pillar, eliminating all options of things you can put in between him and you. Overall, another enjoyable boss battle, and his gooey explosion is mwah, it's simply chef's kiss. Too much constant regenerating from near death has caused the mold within Jack's body to go crazy and mutate even further. This causes Jack to mutate and balloon into a giant monster. Then there's the Jack Kaiju boss battle, which is a lot of fun as you pop all of Jack's eyes in order to weaken him. The battle is especially exciting as you fight in a crumbling and burning boathouse, which is an exciting backdrop for what is, dare I say, an epic battle. You can use the two floors to your advantage and climb up and down to get better angles at Jack's weak spots, and you can buy yourself some time as he climbs up and down to follow you. Keeping your distance and having a lot of ammo and heals really helps get you through. <laughs> Jack's boss battles all end up being memorable because of who he is. Each of these fights with Jack has a distinct feel and atmosphere. Molded Possessed Jack relishes in being evil. He has fun doing messed up and twisted things. He takes pride and joy in hurting Ethan and all the others he comes across. Jack Baker is also the focal point of one of the best cutscenes in the game as he and Ethan connect through the mold momentarily. The real Jack shows a moment of weakness and begs Ethan to kill Ethan and free his family, even if it results in their deaths. The real Jack being completely different from the sarcastic, sadistic serial killer we've come to know. Ethan? Hey, shh, shh, I know, I know, I know. I'm not gonna hurt you. Hell, I never would have if I could have helped it. What do you mean? I'm no killer, son. Neither is Marguerite, nor my boy Lucas, or even Zoe here. That girl, Evelyn, she did this. What the hell is she? Now, what did she do to you? She infected us with her gift. That's what she calls it. I found her near a busted out tank in the bayou. Everything changed after that. So she infects you and then she takes control? No. Not exactly, son. She just... She forces a way into your mind, your soul. You can't fight back. You are connected to her and you can't resist the urge to... You're a different person after that. Just like Mia. So Mia sent me that message because of Evelyn. Listen, the, the girl just wants a family of her own. She's the key, all right? You find her and you stop her. Ethan, free my family. Please. Jack really fulfills the role of father in this messed up family unit. He seems to care for Evelyn. His jealousy of Ethan really adds a nice little dynamic that adds more dimension between the multitude of battles Ethan and Jack partake in. In a way, Jack is Ethan's past, present, and future. Mia disappearing for three years robs Ethan and Mia of the life they could have had together. A normal life where they settle down and have kids. Baby, you've been gone three years. Three years? Has it really been three years? Robbing them of the past three years. Mia is unable to leave because of Daddy Baker and the others, of course. As the head of the family, a lot of the heavy lifting comes from Jack, the father figure. The present battles with Ethan and Jack are a tug of war between the past and future. Jack under the influence of the mold, wants things to stay the same, to live in the present. Ethan is here to end the nightmare and move forward toward a brighter future with Mia. 
and leaving the nightmare behind. Daddy Baker also represents Ethan's future. Ethan is an intruder, one who will take Jack's place if nothing is done. When a burglar breaks into a home, it's usually expected of the father figure of the family to be a real man and defend his family, which is what Jack is doing. Jack also represents Ethan's future as Ethan in RE8 literally becomes Jack. He's just a man who is fighting to save his daughter and to fight for his family. We'll talk more about Ethan in his section, but it was really necessary to talk about him here because I haven't heard many people praise or even mention the interesting dynamics between Jack and Ethan. Bug lady. Need I say any more? Fine, I'll keep going. Marguerite is not as physically strong as Jack. She relies on her lamp and powers to control bugs. She's very vindictive and has some strong mommy dearest vibes. She has set up nest of bugs all over the old house that you can run around or burn and destroy. The flamethrower is especially useful in this section against the spiders, bugs, and Marguerite herself. Using the flamethrower in this section brings major alien vibes. However, if you dislike being hunted and having to sneak around her in her stalking section, you can use your ammo to damage Mommy Baker enough that she flees the old house and gives you some personal space. Hints of Mommy Baker's transformation are creepy, and her reveal is really scary and memorable. Come on now with me! We're gonna settle this! Marguerite will grab most of the players by jump scaring the player on their first attempts. But, if you are quick enough, you can avoid Marguerite's grasp and blast her right in the face. Post-anime transformation, Marguerite's limbs extend and she grows a hive in her lower body, which similarly to Ethan, allows her to craft mid-boss battle. Unlike Ethan, she doesn't craft meds and ammo. Instead, Marguerite has a mechanic where her hive, her hive, or her womb if you would, can produce insect offspring. Anyway, Marguerite's behavior feels similar to how a xenomorph would operate. She can run on all fours, climb walls, leap at you, and she has an inner jaw mouth, except her inner mouth is a centipede. While a xenomorph moves through vents to sneak around you and reposition, Marguerite uses holes in the building's structure to outmaneuver you and catch you by surprise. The smaller bug she produces kind of feels like the little face huggers in a way, so she kind of functions as a mini xenomorph queen. Marguerite has a bit of a tragic end as her body is not nearly as well bonded to the mold as her husband Jack. While Jack can come back from near death again and again and surpass his limits each time he returns like he's a Black Clover character, Marguerite's body, however, has a limit. After a certain amount of damage is dealt, she crumbles to pieces. Marguerite is another fun and memorable antagonist in RE7. You're a fucking disappointment. Then we get to Lucas, clearly the weakest member of the family physically, even compared to his father and mother. He is very jigsaw and collector-esque. Interesting mechanic in the game is Lucas flipping a classic mechanic on its head by having resource crates filled with explosives. If you knife them thinking there were resources inside, you would take damage from the explosion. But if you are careful, you can just shoot the crates from a distance because at this point, you have a decent amount of ammo and resources to craft more. I like to shoot most crates in this section, but if you're a pro big brain gamer, you can also listen closely for a tick or not to determine whether the crate was tampered with by Lucas. Put those 
Christ. The Saw-esque escape room test Lucas puts you through is fun and creative. He takes great pleasure watching his makeshift games. I've called him the games. I'd really like to make it out of this room alive and not die a horrible, painful death. I know. It's a temp title. Take a candle, light it, and put it on the cake. And remember to smile. This party is for you. <laughs> then there's the mechanic of using a tape of found footage from a previous Lucas victim that helps you learn the mechanic of Lucas's main game. You can use someone else's mistakes to your advantage as Ethan uses this to outsmart Lucas and outplay him at his own game. Unfortunately, Lucas and Ethan never cross paths again as Ethan goes on to defeat Evelyn without ever seeing Lucas. Turns out, Lucas would be dealt with by the famous boulder punching idiot himself. Chris Redfield. Lucas's section as Ethan is an interesting section that really adds a few new dimensions to gameplay and almost forces you not to rush, but rather to take your time and pay close attention to your surroundings. There's molded enemies too, so there's combat peppered in throughout the stages and traps set by Lucas. As mentioned earlier, there's trick resource crates that explode. Then there's also trip mines that can be easy to miss when you are rushing and running around all willy-nilly. In the lore, it turns out that Lucas was a troubled youth even before Evelyn possessed the family. He even committed murder when he was a child as he locked up a schoolmate in an attic above his room. Fluids and liquid remains even seeped through the ceiling and smelled really bad according to Lucas. Lucas seemed to be the only one who really never wants things to go back to the way they are. He likes this power. It is intoxicating to him. Looky, looky what I've got. <laughs> you know what this is for? You know what Zoe wants to do with this? <laughs> She thinks this thing is special. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No, Ethan. That ain't special. This, this right here is special. You see, Ethan, not everybody wants to turn back the clock. What? What, Evelyn? I'm just trying to show him. I'm just trying to show him not everybody wants to go back to how things were. Zoe's a stupid bitch. She doesn't understand that I don't want to go back to how things were before my father found y'all. Lucas has always been a monster. He was a killer from childhood and is a true serial killer. Jack Baker only takes pleasure in hurting others after being affected by Evelyn. Similar to Split, this creates a new personality that does enjoy torture and murder. Otherwise, he would have just been a family man. Marguerite seemed almost sweet and motherly in a flashback in the DLC. Zoe, go get some fresh clothes from the laundry room, okay? Good night for soup, don't you think? Excuse me, Lucas. Then she truly dies and crumbles away, almost making her sympathetic. Perhaps she wasn't truly bad. Zoe and Mia both want to escape and break free from Evelyn's influence and infection. They were both never truly bad people and did not want things to stay the same. Lucas would have been a monster regardless if Evelyn showed up or not. In fact, he almost seems to have more knowledge than the other family members. He even seems to have a stronger sense of self and more free will than the others. I'm not gonna lie, the Not A Hero DLC expands on Lucas further, so we'll discuss Lucas a tiny bit later. But for now, just know that while he remained a loose end in the main story, his section and he as a character were truly interesting to see, explore, and learn about. He was a really smart, troubled kid, won a lot of awards, and he was gifted at engineering, which explains how he became one of Jigsaw's many protégés. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock.
Then we get to Evelyn. Evelyn, who is a living bioweapon who attempted to create a family for herself. In fact, she was programmed with the want and need for family. She wanted a mommy and daddy. The closest thing Evelyn felt to love was perhaps Mia. Mia consistently fought Evelyn's control and tried to escape countless times, but Evelyn never gave up on her and killed her. She has very Do Flamingo family and League of Villain-esque motivations to be a part of something greater. Even after fighting Evelyn, freeing Ethan, and letting him escape, Evelyn still chose not to completely annihilate Mia. Mia survives. This villain goal almost feels sympathetic, especially because her one want and desire was programmed into her. Evelyn and others refer to the Molden as her friends. These creatures that she can produce are the closest things she has had to friends after being raised in a lab and being studied her whole existence. What is truly enjoyable about her is not that she is an obnoxious, in-your-face villain, as she is not truly revealed until the end, similar to Wesker in Resident Evil 1. And if you're smart enough, there are clues that tip you off that there's something wrong with the granny from the beginning. Evelyn has a very memorable and sad line in Why Does Everybody Hate? She's more a background villain, if that makes sense, and it works for me because the Bakers are strong enough as antagonists on their own. So I'm cool to have the Bakers in the forefront and Evelyn in the background pulling the strings like she's Do Flamingo. Evelyn is an easy villain to hate, but there is a hint, maybe even a kernel of sympathy to be felt for her. And lastly, to round out the villains, let's end with the Molded. The Molded are the weakest enemy narratively and mechanically, but they can be fun to fight and run from. The Molded function almost like brainless zombies of the old Resident Evil games. They walk slowly at a distance, but can lunge at you and speed up as they get closer. I like the design and look of the Molded. They're towering seven foot tall, symbiote looking shadow monsters. I'd be more scared of seeing this in real life than I would be a zombie. However, I do wish there was more variety among the molded, with more worthwhile gameplay variety as well. We needed more creatures or mutations in the deep south. Maybe another big snake resembling Titano Boa, being a callback to RE1. Even alligators or crocodiles. I would love a giant Lake Placid 40 foot croc boss battle in first person that would hopefully be better to the disappointing sewer gator section in the remake of 2, where all you do is shoot a pipe in his mouth after running about 20 feet. Instead of anything like a, a cool giant crocodile boss battle, instead there's just croc evasion sections in one of the DLC. The basic molded function similar to basic zombies. Then there's the tankier carnage weapon arm molded, which do more damage and take more damage. Next is the weaker four-legged molded, which have slightly less health, especially if you aim for their heads, but they are the fastest and speediest out of the molded forms. The boomers are next, the fat boys. They can projectile vomit and have a lot of health. They are basic but enjoyable mini bosses in between the Baker battles. The Molded are still enjoyable, but they needed a little bit more variety and flavor. They all feel very basic. Foot Soldier, Tank, Speedy Gonzalez, Riot, etc. More creativity would have been appreciated, but it really shows the care and love given to the Bakers, which makes them stand out even more and makes them more memorable when compared to the Molded. But for what they are worth, for this one game, they function well and are a fun one-off enemy type for the game. 
A nice little shake up and spin on the classic zombie enemy archetype the series started with. Now let's talk about some of the other characters who aren't villains. Let's start with our main man himself, Ethan Winters. Ethan Bradbury! Love him. Ethan is one of my favorite Resident Evil characters. In fact, he may be my favorite main character. Ethan is a really simple character and that works with me. Ethan is enough of a blank canvas that you can project yourself onto him no matter who you are, especially if you identify with his goal of saving a loved one. However, he's not so blank and boring as to have no personality or character. Ethan has one goal and one thing on his mind. Da booty. I mean Mia. She is the goal from the beginning to the end. So if you, if you don't fuck with Ethan's personal goal, you might not fuck with Ethan like I do. Ethan has fun reactions to the horrors he experiences, and he even has comebacks and one-liners for the villains and victims he comes across. I've always said that Ethan has big dad energy, even before the release of RE8. Ethan's body takes quite a lot of damage all throughout the game, but somehow Ethan perseveres, and spoilers for Resident Evil 8, but coming back to replay 7 after playing 8, it does slightly add a new dimension knowing that Ethan has the mold flowing through his veins all throughout this game, explaining how he can survive taking so much damage. Ethan is like Asta from Black Clover. He is so normal and unremarkable that that is precisely what makes him special. <laughs> Even compared to his wife, Ethan is just some Joe Schmo. Like, look at the fit this man pulled up in and had to wear all throughout the story. He's just some random ass normal person. There is nothing special about him. I mean, his wife is a special forces tactical mercenary assassin, Angelina Jolie, John Wick, Star Wars bounty hunter super wife, and that makes Ethan seem even more normal by comparison. That is what I love about him as well. Even though he stumbles on this crazy three year long nightmare situation, he refuses to abandon his wife and he overcomes the nightmare. He isn't a seeker agent, experienced cop, hell, he ain't even a rookie cop. He's just Ethan with a little bit of mold. The mold bonds differently with each host, giving them a different power, different amount of regen ability, and different amount of physical strength. Other than Evelyn and Rose in RE8, the two with the strongest bond to the mold are Ethan and Jack Baker. Jack cheats death like half a dozen times, same with Ethan. Daddy Baker gets shot, hit with a car, chainsawed, exploded, grenaded, and almost cured. However, his bond was so strong that each time Jack Baker overcame death, he became mindless, seemingly losing his ability to speak more and more as time went on, as he regenerated. When he's in Godzilla mode, he struggles to form sentences and speak. His mind is not all there. He is losing himself. His bond was so strong and he was so far gone through transformations and overexerting himself that he completely lost all ability to form speech and couldn't even recognize his brother in the DLC. Heck of a thing, man. This sure shit beats the hell out of dying. Sorry. Get some ass back to the house. I will deal with you later. Jack? What the fuck? God damn it, Jack! Don't you remember your brother? Don't do it! Don't you touch her! Jack! Similarly though, Ethan also overuses the mold. Meanwhile, Lucas and Marguerite die and fall apart. This shows that Ethan and Jack are both truly built differently. What I think really drove them to form such a strong bond with the mold was their goal to protect their family. This parental instinct seems to be strongest in Ethan, which is why he survives being bonded with the molded and regains control. 
Evelyn's fake love and familiar bond that she forced on the others is nothing compared to the amount of motherfuckers a father will fuck up if someone messes with their little girl or their wife. Even though he doesn't show up till the end, let's get to Chris. And in my opinion, Chris is better here than he is in RE5. I think that no one has quite put into words how I feel about Chris in RE5 better than internet historian. I do think Chris is one of the most emotionally constipated characters we've come across. It's a mix of I'm incredibly well adjusted and stoic and also I don't know how to deal with anything compared to everybody else. <laughs> I like Chris here. He seems a bit more emotionally mature and stable. He doesn't feel like a 15 year old high schooler with the form of a bodybuilder. He's quieter, almost wiser, more worn than I remember in 5. Again, I only played 6 for an hour once, so I didn't get to see too much of Chris in that. Here, Chris seems to care about the people under his command. His comrades, if you would. Their deaths weigh on him, unlike in RE5, where he's like, damn, Alpha Team all got wiped and Josh is the only survivor. Shit, that's crazy. Anyway, have you guys seen where my big titty cop girl, I mean, Jill went? Did you guys see where she went? Like, where is she? Is she over here? Is she over there? You guys know where she's at? You, you got her number? Somebody, please, Jill. Jill, I need Jill! We don't get too much out of Chris, but the little bit we do get has me hopeful for his future in the franchise. Go, 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 go! Don't move! Get your hands up! Get down! Weapons down! Weapons down! <laughs> It's all right. You must be Zoe Baker. Who the hell's asking? Chris Redfield. Been looking all over for you. We're here to help. Then we got to Zoe, perhaps the least memorable Baker. Zoe really needed more time and attention. Uh, as you can see, we talked about Chris Redfield, who appeared in the final two minutes of the main game and had a one hour long DLC to himself. So we talked about him before we got to Zoe. So that should tell you everything you need to know about Zoe. Zoe feels like she falls to the wayside and is forgotten even after getting a DLC all about saving her. We learn nothing new about her at all. The DLC mainly shows that she survived as you spend the whole DLC attempting to reach her. During the main campaign, she's more of an oracle, or a watchtower character who exclusively communicates with Ethan through phone calls. There is a really weak ass choice between her and Mia. If you choose Mia, you still play as Mia regardless. Zoe gets frozen. The canon choice is Mia, because duh. You do not see what becomes of Zoe in the main story, but Ethan does contact her in the DLC that takes place after the main story. Zoe seemed brave to have fought and struggled for three years, and she never lost control of her sense of self and attacked Ethan. There are even hints that Zoe has a crush on Ethan and hopes to leave with him. Did you find it? Yeah, I got it. Are we really going to be able to make serum with this thing? It'll be fine. After we make it, we can get out of here. Together. I'll be waiting for you in the trailer. As if Ethan is her Prince Charming, her Shrek come to save her from her dragon trapping her in the tower. This little fantasy or dream Zoe has explains why she would seriously think Ethan might choose her over Mia. I mean remember, she has been trapped here for three years struggling to survive and Ethan is the first outsider to stand a chance against her captors and bewitched family. It feels as if they cut out a lot of this romance or jealousy subplot, but there are hints here and there suggesting a romantic connection between Zoe and Ethan, even if that connection is a bit more one-sided. Ethan even finds a bra of Zoe's in her trailer. The subplot ends up falling flat and being forgotten, similar to Zoe herself as a character. She gets even further overshadowed by her more memorable family members. She made zero appearances in RE8, and I don't think she even gets name dropped, even though she survived RE7. This makes her feel more forgettable, 
making her a real tragic character. She lived a tragic three years and left a tragic legacy, a forgotten one. You're gonna be just fine. I was trapped with those monsters for three years. All of them trying to kill me. I can't believe it's finally over. You gotta know, deep down somewhere, they were still your family. And they loved you. Especially your daddy. Even in his final days. <laughs> Campaign and story. Well, we've already covered the story summary and gone over character arcs and gameplay mechanics for specific characters, but here are some brief thoughts on the campaign itself and its story. I think this is easily one of the strongest campaign stories in the series. From arriving as Ethan to bonding with the Bakers and picking up the pieces of what occurred here three years ago, there's journal entries and hints of a wrecked boat in the bayou and we get to go to that derelict ship and I love the spooky Scooby-Doo haunted ship vibes. I love the inner workings of the Bakers and how they came to be as a family. It wasn't just Umbrella or Wesker behind everything, and this is one of the more unique plots in the series. We've discussed plenty of the mansion sections and the boat section, but there is one section that is not as strong. To me, the mine is the weakest location visually and design-wise. I would have preferred a section exploring the bayou in a small open world section similar to the open-ended village sections in RE8. And to be fair, we do kind of get this as Joe, but even still, these sections are very linear and clearly lay out a path for you to follow, as they are not so much as open-ended as the village in 8, or even the small open worlds of Evil Within 2. But enough of what could have been. The mine is a nice little change of scenery, and it has a claustrophobic feel, but it happens at the end of the game, so most of the tension is gone by this point, as you have a complete arsenal of weapons from your grenade launcher, to your assault rifle, to your magnum, and more. So there isn't much sneaking around and taking your time at this part. The mine section is packed mostly with action, so it does have its own distinct feel and does a good job making you feel empowered, but I prefer the more tense cat and mouse sections with Daddy Baker back at the mansion, juggling ammo and supplies, not sure if I had enough ammo or, or heals for the fight ahead. Meanwhile, the mine supplies you with plenty of ammo and healing items on top of what you've already collected thus far. In fact, the lead up to the mine is better than the mine itself as you are above ground and dawn is about to break on the bayou. There's helicopters in the distance and it's your first real time outside not out in the baker's backyard or outside on a dock, but outside on real solid ground. And you're not surrounded by enemies at the moment. In the campaign, I would also have liked more info and reveals on the group behind Evelyn, known as the Connections, who only briefly get mentioned in RE8. So even now, we still barely know anything about the Connections. In fact, to this day, the most important and meaningful content we have that covers the connections is the Not A Hero DLC. You could play that one DLC alone and know more about the connections than someone who only played the main campaigns for RE7 and RE8. So in order to follow the current main story of Resident Evil, the Not A Hero DLC is mandatory homework and I don't think enough people realize this. But, minus some flaws and blemishes, this is still one of the strongest campaigns in the series, in my opinion. Alright, gameplay and difficulty. One of the main gripes I have with the game is the difficulty. Upon your first playthrough, there are only two options. Easy and normal. Nothing crazy, which is fine. But there is only one other unlockable difficulty, Madhouse which is every bit as fun as it sounds. It really feels as if there is a missing middle step between Madhouse and Normal. For me, RE7 really felt like a good jumping on point for the series, but 
not having a middle difficulty between normal and madhouse kind of makes it slightly less attractive as a uh, as a newcomer to the franchise i've beaten re7 about a dozen times but never beaten the game on madhouse i had only ever tried madhouse once before and i definitely didn't beat the game so for this review i played and beat the game on madhouse let me tell you madhouse was everything i wanted and it is perhaps the best way to play the game. It offers a real challenge for the player, and especially players who might feel as if they have seen everything in the game, such as myself, at least on normal. Sure, I die here and there, even on normal, but at this point, normal was just too easy, so I jumped into Madhouse. As difficulty ramps up in the game, you lose movement speed, resources and ammo become less abundant, enemies hit harder and tank more damage while you get more and more weak even item and enemy placement has changed from easy and normal to madhouse early on i got away from jack and some molded on madhouse but i managed to get away by escaping to a different section of the house i was running down what is normally a completely empty and normal hallway to the nearest safe room i was home free but then a four-legged molded appeared this changed the game just enough for me. You don't know when an enemy might pop up in an unexpected spot. You find yourself checking every nook and cranny more and more as you find items in hidden away spots. On normal and easy, there are chances where you are free to run around the mansion without Jack chasing you after you defeat him between boss battles, such as after the garage battle. After he not alives himself, he will not spawn in the house again until you grab the wooden statuette out of the moldy muck bathtub on the second floor. This triggers a cutscene announcing Jack's return. However, on Madhouse, a random Jack wearing a shirt again for some reason spawns and continues to chase you throughout the house. A genuine clone of Jack does not allow you even the briefest glimmer of hope. Anyway. Stay right there. I'm an old man, son. You can't take on an old man? The fuck you say to me, you little shit? Now, I'm not the kind of Resident Evil gamer who wants to beat it as quickly as possible and completely ignore most enemies. I'm not that kind of player. In most RE games, I go out of my way to take my time, smell the roses, enjoy the scenery and atmosphere, and I like to kill as many enemies as possible, if not most or all of them. I spare no enemies, zombies, and even molded, be it in any of the Resident Evil games. It just feels weird ignoring scores of enemies when combat is such a core aspect of these games for me. Madhouse for a player like me is really quite a test of metal and skill. Even on Madhouse, if you are careful and skilled enough, you can still kill about 90% of all the enemies and still have a decent amount of ammo left over by the end. So, there's plenty of room for your own playstyle. You can rely on stealth, your weapon arsenal, healing items, and resources to create your own little playstyle or mix of styles. You can be a cowardly speedrunner who lets all these venoms live. And most people view this as cowardice and me being a big old pussy. However, I view it quite the opposite. I viewed it as me being a fearless warrior. Or you can be a total badass being of pure destruction who never backs down from a good fight, regardless of ammo count. Speaking of movement, it does vary from difficulty to difficulty. I replayed the game on easy after beating Madhouse in order to get some extra footage, and it really feels like you are Usain Bolt on easy. On Madhouse, even sprinting full speed from Jack, he would always catch up even though he never runs. He only ever slasher villain walks. 
He's speed walking at best, but his speed walking is enough to catch up to Ethan, bolting at top speed on Madhouse. How am I gonna replace this? I, I can't fucking compete! I just can't fucking compete! I'm on to you! So I'm gonna pay you $100 to fuck off. If you pick up the game, I recommend a playthrough on normal and easy before even attempting Madhouse. I recommend playing on easy mode after normal in order to beat the game under four hours and get yourself that buzzsaw for that Madhouse playthrough. You'll use this knowledge in New Game Plus to your advantage as your arsenal grows depending on how you beat the game, rewarding you with great weapons right from the beginning of another playthrough, such as the buzzsaw, which slightly fills in the chainsaw-shaped hole in your heart. Now, meet me in the garage. We'll talk there. Hey, wait. You gotta give me your gun. <laughs> you must have lost your mind. Look, officer. Hey, deputy. Right. Deputy. Now, do you want to see my name in the obituaries? Or do you want to be a hero and save my life? A fucking pocket knife? Here. Take it. That's all you're gonna get. Now go. Garage. Now. What am I gonna do with a knife? Or, fuck it. Be a mad lad and play it on Madhouse on your first blind playthrough. You do you, baby. While I loved RE7's campaign, at first, there did feel as if there was a lack of extra content, especially something like a mercenaries mode. As time went on, we received a few drops of DLC. The DLC for this game really makes this game not only a full package, but a rather impressive package. This video is already long enough, so I am only going to briefly discuss the DLC so that if you have never played it, you can experience it for yourself and have some surprises. And first, let me start off by saying I absolutely love the amount of DLC and the variety of DLC for the game. Let's start with Band Footage Volume 1. This volume has a nice mix of gameplay. It includes the nightmare and bedroom scenarios. The nightmare scenario is the survive the night scenario where you must survive waves of molded and hold out until 5 a.m. If you enjoy the combat and wave-based survival games complete with auto turrets, then this is the DLC for you, and it is one of my favorite pieces of DLC for its simplistic fun and challenge. Choosing to have this wave-based section take place in the basement was an especially good decision because it really adds a little taste of horror to the action. The bedroom scenario has you attempt to solve puzzles and use clues to find a way out of the room Marguerite has you trapped in. This one is a slower paced scenario that requires problem solving and thinking on your feet to escape as Marguerite returns from time to time. There is no combat, minus stabbing Marguerite once. Also it is hilarious to me that if you eat too much of the black goo soup, you can commit not alive to yourself. 10 out of 10 for that reason alone. <laughs> then we get to band footage volume 2. Let's start with 21. 21 meme. The 21 scenario is a Lucas based scenario where you play as one of his victims who must compete with another person in a classic card game of 21. 
This one is suspenseful and goes on for longer than you think it would. There are even a few new Lucas created rules and cards at your disposal. This sick sadistic scenario is almost darkly funny as Lucas has fun laughing at your pain. It's really hard to explain, but I like the suspense and dark humor in this DLC, so 21 is a very good scenario. Then the daughter's component of volume 2 of the band footage takes us back to the beginning of the nightmare and you see how things played out. It feels nice seeing glimpses of how the bakers were before Evelyn's mold infected them. Let's get this poor girl some fresh clothes and into a warm bed. Mm. We'll put her in Lucas's old room. Oh, come on, can't you put her somewhere else? Oh, Lucas, you just hush. You've long outgrown that room. Always want to run a bed and breakfast. <laughs> Got your big break, didn't you? <laughs> Naughty Hero. Ah, Naughty Hero establishes more information on the corporation or group known as the Connections, the group that created Evelyn. Chris Redfield comes in guns blazing and must neutralize Lucas Baker. Lucas this whole time was working with the Connections and they even had a whole ass lab underground in the mines to study Evelyn and monitor their experiments. This DLC does a good job feeling like a small compact campaign. Playing as Chris is fun and he has better tools and weapons to use in battle compared to Ethan's arsenal. The final boss battle is fun and finally finishing off Lucas feels satisfying after being forced through so many of his traps and games and getting revenge for all of his victims just feels really satisfying. End of Zoe is a fun, goofy, melee brawler focused story following Joe Baker, Jack's brother, who <laughs> was never once mentioned. End of Zoe is a fun, goofy melee brawler focused story following Joe Baker, Jack's brother and Zoe's uncle. He is strong enough to punch off molded heads, so you punch molded, throw spears at lame insta-kill gators, and even get a mechanical super arm. You picked the wrong house, fool! Uh, charging. Charge complete. Charging. Charge complete. Also, Jack Baker survived the main story, transformed yet again. <sighs> Fuck, this man's giving Frieza a run for his money at this point. Oh. He copied my whole fucking flow! Oh, word for shit. word, bar for bar! Nothing really happens here story-wise. You get closure on Zoe, learn almost nothing about Joe, and Jack just ends up dying again by the end of the DLC's run. It's a fun hour-long punching DLC, but ends up being kind of forgettable as not much happens. The DLC is just here to explain what happened to Zoe, but once again, we learn almost nothing about her here, and she spends 99% of the campaign in a crystallized state of hibernation. But hearing her talk to Ethan and finding out they both survived the night is somewhat touching. Not as good as the main campaign, or even the Not A Hero DLC campaign, but it does provide a nice little fun, less serious punching story. Someone wants to speak to you. Zoe! Zoe, are you there? It's you! I don't believe it, you actually made it. We both did. You didn't forget about me. I told you I'd send help, and I always keep my promises. Thank you, Ethan. Ethan Must Die is the hardest content in the game. The less you know, the better. Also, I'm taking executive action, and I'm trying to keep this vid under two hours, so if you want to check out the content featured in Ethan Must Die, just know that I like it. It's a fun trial and error game mode with arcade-like elements such as crate rarity. It's about as close to Dark Souls that Resident Evil can get in terms of difficulty, so try it out for yourself.
The amount of DLC and variety between game modes gives a great balance and has something for everyone. From many campaign experiences, to less serious, more fun arcade game modes, to the ultra hard Ethan Must Die mode. There's a good reuse of assets, such as campaign locations, to create new and varied content. Oh, and let me just end the DLC section by saying Jack's 55th birthday is fucking awesome. Music. I'm not a huge music guy, so there's not much I can say about it, except whether I liked it or not. There's a lot of really good music stings and callbacks to earlier uh, entries in the franchise, such as RE2. As a whole, the music is pretty great. It sounds eerie and helps set the mood for this horrific atmosphere, the standout track being their rendition of Go Tell Aunt Rhody. Also, the safe room theme is one of my favorite save room themes in the whole franchise. Uh, if I have to think of some of my other favorites, I guess RE2 and RE3 maybe have the best safe room themes, and RE7 as well. RE1's got a good one, but in my opinion, 2, 3, and 7 have better safe room themes. Anyway, the point is the music is good, and I don't know how to articulate myself very well when it comes to music. So, moving on. The atmosphere. I absolutely love the atmosphere and feel of the game. A lot of this is due to the art direction and art design as well. The phrase, dark and gritty, gets thrown out a bit too much nowadays, especially in Hollywood. But this really feels like a darker, grittier Resident Evil. We go back to the basics of horror. No more punching boulders, no outrunning boulders, and certainly no outrunning dozens of exploding cars. The atmosphere can be dark and depressing in areas, especially the basement and ship sections. I almost fucked that up. <laughs> but sometimes you can get moments of brief reprieve. And during these moments, I love to take my time to smell the roses and just enjoy the atmosphere. The trailer save room is the best example of this. I love standing in the save room as the theme plays giving me time to plan, breathe, and even relax. Save rooms are not new to the RE series, but they feel particularly special here, like the save rooms in RE2. Going back to the grittier atmosphere, I love how absolutely dirty, grimy, and disgusting everything is, from the food to the buildings and the people. Everything has a few shades of dirt coated on it, and I'm all here for it. I like the combat in Resident Evil 7. It feels satisfying using a shotgun to explode a molded's head, or a pistol to blow off their limbs one at a time. The first person perspective really gives the combat and gameplay a new feel compared to the combat in third person and fixed camera angles. This also makes it easier to assume the role of Ethan in first person. With third person over the shoulder and fixed camera angles, you are always slightly removed from the horrors you experience. And so, all of the horror in Resident Evil 7 feels much more in your face and makes the torture and scares feel more personal and aimed towards you, the player, rather than the character you are playing as. Boss fights, as I said earlier, are fun and memorable, especially Jax. The rest of the gameplay is what you'd expect. Explore locations for supplies, ammo, weapons, and more to aid you. There's puzzles, although a few feel a little weak here. The puzzles get carried by the rest of the game, so I can easily overlook this. Ammo crafting from the original RE3 makes a return and has cemented itself since as a mainstay for the series. After RE3 and RE7, it's carried on to the remakes of 2, 3, the upcoming remake of 4, and it was in Resident Evil Village. One of the game's best decisions was deciding to include ammo crafting again. It especially makes your crafting choices much more difficult. Now, 
I've sung the game's praises mostly, but at this point, I think it's time to get into some of the negatives of the game. We've touched base on a couple of them, but now this section, we're going to really get into them. There's not too many gripes that I have with the game, but there certainly are a few. So, let's get into it. The Zoe Mia choice. I wanted to start with this because it's one of the more disappointing aspects of the game. As stated previously, the choice was weak. A choice mechanic would be fun if we were given more choices in the game, but you only get this one. You still play as Mia regardless of your decision, but the biggest difference is the ending. Although your choice only slightly changes the ending. If you chose Mia, then she will be on the helicopter at the end of the game, hence the good ending. If you chose Zoe, because you're a man whore, then Mia dies and Ethan rides the helicopter into the sunrise, destined to die a virgin now that Mia is gone. Oh, and uh, Zoe dies too, I guess. Hence the bad ending. Discuss this slightly, but another negative is I would have enjoyed more enemy variety. The game needed more molded types or a wider array of enemy variety or more mini bosses. I like the molded, they're fun to fight, but I would want them to be the new basic mainstay enemies. Sure, watching the Power Rangers fight putties is cool, but you know what's cooler? Seeing them fight the much more interesting monster of the week. Same goes here. Fighting the molded is fun, but the bosses really shine and are much more complex than the molded putties. I would have enjoyed more varied mutated wildlife, giant molded gators that aren't one hit kill stealth section enemies. Maybe a mutated mole or possum, I don't know. This isn't a negative that I had, but many people mentioned feeling as if the game does not connect enough to previous entries, characters, or storylines. And that's okay with me, but I thought I should add this here to the negatives because there are a lot of people that don't like the fact that Resident Evil 7 barely has anything to do with the prior plots. People want their Weskers, their Uroboros, their Spain, their, their Bingo, etc. A gripe that I do have that stems from not having a more connected plot to the previous entries is the game leaves you with a lot more questions than answers. Although, some people might like that, such as Umbrella. They bring an Umbrella in the last five minutes. It's new Umbrella, apparently a lot of things has gone down, and Umbrella is combating bioweapons that they were creating before, so they're kind of cleaning up the mess, but you barely get anything out of that. Chris shows up in the last 30 seconds or whatever, says his name, that's about it. You know what I mean? What has he been doing? Why is he working with New Umbrella? How did this happen? Uh, the connections, this apparently gonna be like the new big Umbrella like organization, but we've had two full games and we have barely scratched the surface of the connections. So we'll see what happens with them. So the connections, another, a lot more unanswered questions there. Uh, if you played the campaign originally at release, Lucas Baker was a loose end and he, he, his story gets resolved in DLC as stated. But again, there's a lot of little things like this. The game does leave you with more questions than answers. For some, that might be a negative. And for me, it kind of was in the beginning. I remember wanting a little bit more into the background behind Evelyn. Another minor gripe, the graphics are starting to show their age and wrinkles a little bit, but I can't complain about that too much. I love the game regardless. Ever since its release, Resident Evil 7 has been a game I can jump right into at any time. I love almost everything about the game. The gameplay, the atmosphere, the music, the art, the villains, and more. 
Ethan remains as one of my favorite Resident Evil protagonists, and I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Ethan's my boy. The whole game is just oozing with personality and charm, and I can't help myself but love it. No matter how shit life is, I can always jump right into RE7 and get lost in one of my favorite games and know that everything's gonna be alright. Perimeter wall is up and operational. Good. Think we did any good here? Not for them, unfortunately. But the mold is contained. Hopefully, they're Evie's last victims. Hopefully. Chris, there's a call for you. You need to take it back at the camp. All right. I'm on my way. <laughs> 